Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. And by Club 1921, where diabetes connections are made. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, diagnosed almost 60 years ago, Joanne Milo loves technology and helped start the popular Loop and Learn group. She's also passionate about diabetes and aging. She shares an eye-opening conversation with a friend who said, well, what's the problem? You're living longer. No, no, we're grateful. Honestly, we're very grateful, but it's not without its issues. And he sat back and he went, huh, it's kind of like people with HIV. They weren't supposed to live this long, but they no. are now. And the medications have caused complications. The disease itself causes complications, but they're living with it now. And they're also aging. Joanne talks about her book, being prepared for emergencies, and so much more. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I'm always so glad to have you here. We aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. And oh my gosh, last week with that Dexcom episode, we got so many new people. So welcome. Glad to have you here. More listeners, more people in the Facebook group. We are all very excited, apparently, about the G7 and about new technology. I don't mind sharing that that episode saw the largest one-day download or, or listening to the podcast in its history. And I've been doing this podcast since June of 2015. So it was a big deal. And I'm really glad you're here. We do focus on technology quite a bit on the podcast. Uh, you listeners have told me that is your number one concern. That's what you are most interested in. And I am happy to oblige. But not every week is going to be about a deep dive into a device. We do have that coming up. So I want to let you know right off the bat, next week, I'm talking to Tandem. We're going to go through their five-year plan they released in December with new devices, new software updates, everything from Control IQ updates to Mobi, their, their tiny little pump, and um, other things that they talked about in that R&D presentation. So I'm excited to bring you that will be next week. And I just did an interview with the folks making a brand new pump. It's called Siggy. It is just starting to be in, in testing and trials now. They're hoping to bring it to the United States in a couple of years. But Siggy is interesting because it's a patch pump, but it's not disposable. If you're in the Facebook group, you know why I shared information about uh, both of those interviews already and took your questions. The best way to get questions to me for these newsmakers and, and device companies is to join the Facebook group. It's Diabetes Connections of the group, and I'll link it up in the show notes. But you can always email me as well. Stacy at diabetes-connections.com and let me know what you want to hear. So if technology is the number one issue for you as you listen, close behind it is aging and diabetes. And I know, you know, we have a lot of parents who listen with little kids, but we also have a lot of adults with type one and a lot of adults over the age of 50. And I'm not telling you anything new. Many of these folks who were diagnosed in the 50s and 60s and even 70s were told that they were not going to live very long, which is terrible to think about. But as people are living longer with type 1 diabetes, there are not a lot of resources. There's not a lot of research. There's not a lot of information on getting older with diabetes. So this is something I'm going to be focusing on this year as well. And this week, my guest really contradicts the stereotype that you have to be under 40 to adopt any new technology. We hear that a lot. But Joanne Milo was so taken with Night Scout and looping and everything pretty close to the beginning of the DIY movement that she helped found what's now called the Loop and Learn Group out in California. And, you know, it's on everywhere, of course, on Facebook and YouTube. They do some great interviews and some talks, and I'll link that up as well. Joanne is also the author of the blog and book, The Savvy Diabetic, A Survival Guide, and she shares more about that in our interview. Joanne was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1965, 57 years ago this month. She has a lot of useful information and a terrific story. I hope you enjoy this interview. Joanne, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm so glad you had some time for me. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here with you as well. Go for it. I'm, I'm ready to talk. <laughs> well, we've got a lot to talk about. So if I am not mistaken, I'm trying to do the math here. It seems to me that you are coming up on 57 years since you were diagnosed. I am. I remember the the day, the day of the week, the time of the day, what wow. the weather was like. I remember everything about that moment. Tell um, us about it, that. It was um it was 1965. It was 
January 25th, which was a Monday. It was 5.30 p.m. I had been home sick from school and I hadn't been feeling well. A um, month before we had been on vacation and I was swilling diet Cokes, mm. real Cokes, and so thirsty, but I was losing weight. And then when we got back from vacation, I was in ballet and I'd come home and drink a gallon of orange juice. Wow. And but no one said anything. They well, I was exercising, I was drinking, and then one day I just didn't feel well. I had a headache, just didn't feel well. My mom took me to my pediatrician, who I think we didn't have finger sticks then, so I'm sure he did a test tape, urine test tape. I remember him sitting in in a room. It was a, it, it was in his office, and it was very somber and only one little office light. And he hmm. sat down and he explained that I had diabetes and. I did not comprehend what that meant. It sounded to me like dots, diabetes dots. I, I don't know. I thought I was going to start having spots everywhere. <laughs> so I didn't know, but he did not hospitalize me because I was frightened of hospitals. Um, had had an experience as a three-year-old where I jumped on the bed and swallowed a, a lollipop. And a, and a nurse slapped me to stop me from crying so she'd give me a shot. I remember oh my that. Gosh. So I didn't want to go to the hospital and... So he stepped my mom through shots through the night and a test tape, and we did okay. I think my mom suffered more than I did because every shot she agonized over. It it was always difficult for her. And I just remember we did a lot of learning, and I lived in the suburbs of New York City, and so we ended up going to a world-renowned specialist in New York City who scared the bejesus out of me. Because it is sixty five and offices were darker um they it just seemed like catacombs, and the guy kind of scared me, so then we went to another endo in New York who was over the top. People who grew up in New York knew this guy. he wrote one of the major books is Henry Dolger, and he did not believe in tight control because he thought low blood sugar was dangerous mm-hmm. and he he really promoted that, and it turns out. He was disastrous for a lot of kids. BS, I had friends who just didn't make it through because they ran so high all the time. But we we learned. And all through high school, at Christmas times, my mom decided I should go to Joslin Clinic. And at the time, it was a clinic where you stayed for a week. You got up at 5.30 in the morning. You collected your urine in these pitchers made out of, of aluminum. And then you'd shuffle down the hall with your little pitcher and everyone would be going down the hall to have your urine tested. And if it tested high, you would send back to drink some water and pee again in a half an hour. This is all at 530. I remember that. And then all day you went to classes. It was an interesting time, but I was such an emotional kid that my blood sugars were all over the place. And it took me two weeks every Christmas because they couldn't quite get me under control. Wow. Um, so from there, I developed a dislike of the city of Boston. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> but I've been back since, and the lobster's good, and it's okay. But <laughs> in retrospect, when I was 35, I thanked my parents for the education. It was valuable. It just was a little overwhelming. And growing up in a, in a dysfunctional family, a lot of emotional reactions to my poor child has to not eat this, so let's have some ice cream. It wasn't the best environment, but it wasn't deliberate. It was just a tough time growing up. And then I went away to college and it was, it was, it was all just very interesting. Can I stop you before you go to the college years? I'm curious too, the doctor that you said didn't want to keep kids lower. I'm thinking about the little that I know about that time period. And the insulin was not as precise. The, you know, the blood sugar monitoring barely existed, right? You're talking about urine tests, which showed where your blood glucose was hours prior. Do you think he had a good reason for doing that? I'd love to learn more about what he meant. Yeah, he he actually wrote a book. I I have the book and I've read it and tried to understand. He was very large personality. And so you'd go in there and he'd introduce you to a kid who had just gotten back from Europe. See, you can travel the world. You can do Uh, anything you want. But he was very frightened of low blood sugars because that's when you could have seizures. Right. I think it wasn't as known of the dangers of highs at that time. I don't know why he didn't, but after about two or three years, my parents said, this doesn't make any sense. It just, it's not logical. When I wrote my book, and we could talk about that, one of my reviewers, because I commented on that, and she said, you have to understand the thinking at the time. There wasn't a lot of knowledge. No, there was no 
blood sugar testing. It was Clinitest, which you could cheat on because I knew how to cheat it. Um, <laughs> it was test tubes and, and a little fuzzy tablet. And if you put less urine in or more water or you shook it before it was done bubbling, you could get a, a good color. And and not that my parents punished me, but I wanted I wanted to achieve, so I wanted good colors. And blue was the color I wanted. So it was pretty random. When I was in, oh gosh, probably 11th grade, the very first blood glucose meter came out. It was called the Ames Eye Tone Reflectance Meter. I have one still. And wow. it was really crude. It took, I think, two minutes. It was a needle pin that kind of bounced on the graph. And it was so subject to uh, operator error. You could plot the, the strip too much or not enough and get different readings. But it was the first meter and it was $450 wow. in 1970. And my parents bought one that wasn't covered by insurance. And you had to plug it in, you had to warm it up. And I took that to college with me. It gave some guideline that was better than urine testing. And How often we, did you check in college? Do you remember if you had to plug it in and warm it up and do all that? In my freshman year, not often. But by sophomore year, the life scan came out with their portable. That also, I think, that was 45 seconds. How often did I test? Probably three to four times a day. Okay. It, it wasn't a lot. I'm not sure. I, I had no knowledge of nutrition. I had no knowledge of glycemic index. and it was a random thing. It was, that meal looks big, that meal looks small. Oh, sure, I can have a donut. I'll just take some sort of shot. So I probably ran high for four years at college. I imagine that you, like many people that I've talked to who were diagnosed in the 50s or 60s, even into the 70s, that you were you were not told what I'm thankful that my son was told and, and people are told today, which is you can live a long and healthy life with type 1. What did the doctors tell you? 40. I'd be dead by 40. Oh. That was the understanding. And every time we heard that, my mom would just cringe and start to cry. I didn't take that in because I didn't. it didn't make sense to me. That at, at that age, you don't think about your lifespan. But it was in there. It was absolutely in there. I was, and still am, frightened of complications. And when I've developed things, I really have to work to control my my emotional reaction because it's so deep in there that, oh my gosh, you're going to be in trouble. You're not going to make it. When I passed 40, it, it, there was a celebration. It's like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> I did it. So yes, it, it, we were. you talked to pretty much anyone who was born about my age and diagnosed then. That's what they were told. So it was 40. I think a couple of years later, it inched up to 50. And those were the numbers based on people in the 1940s. Right. So it was old data. And it was partly meant to frighten you, I think, to pay attention. Although you didn't have the tools to pay attention, but you were supposed to pay attention anyway. It's a great point because when I think about what people are told today, there's such so much more an emphasis. It seems, right, if you've got a good endocrinologist on trying to live well, not scaring people, but we do have so many more tools. And I don't want to skip around too much, but boy, you have embraced the tools <laughs> 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 to the point where, you know, you run this loop and learn group. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that came to be? There's this stereotype of people, you know, oh, people over the age of 50 don't want to adopt any kind of new technology, diabetes or not. Right back to Joanne. But first, I want to tell you about one of our sponsors, Diabetes Connections, is brought to you by Dexcom. And Dexcom has a diabetes management software called Clarity. Do you use this? Because for a very long time, for longer than I would like to admit, I thought it was just something our endocrinologist could use, but it's really helpful. You know, now you have it on your phone. You can use it on the desktop or as an app, but it's an easy way to keep track of the big picture. I find I use it when we're adjusting things. I mean, I felt like for a while there it was nonstop, but you know, Benny's 17. So he is kind of leveled out, at least for now, on the growth and the basal rates and the hormones. Clarity really helps us, though, see longer term trends, and it helps me not overreact. The overlay reports put context to Benny's glucose levels and patterns. And when you do share your reports with your care team, it's so easy for them to get a great idea of what's going on and how they can help. Managing diabetes is not easy, but I feel like we have one of the best CGM systems working for us. Find out more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Now back to my conversation with Joanne, and we are moving into how she found all the DIY folks and the new technology.
I love technology. I, I in, in my career, I had worked for a company that was early into research of artificial intelligence oh. technology and machinery. And I was in marketing at the time, so I had to explain it. But my customers were university-based research centers. And I was just real intrigued with expert systems and I learned how to code in it and learned how to be a knowledge engineer. And it was just really cool. My dad was an engineer. He adopted the first uh, electronic calculator that was this gigantic machine. And <laughs> he didn't do very much, but he loved it. And he would show me how, how it was programmed. And so that stuff just really intrigues me. You know, when I get, could get the newest meter, I got the newest meter because I wanted something better and I was curious about how it worked. And so that's kind of stuck with me all through. And so this was, gosh, in 2014, I heard about Night Scout and I heard you could build a rig. And I was like, I don't know, but that sounds cool. <laughs> and I think this was, you know, the internet wasn't, I don't even think it was on Facebook. I'm not sure how the connection happened, but I was able to buy an Android phone and develop the rig that would show my blood sugar on my Pebble watch. So I had to buy all these things. And my husband says, what are you doing? And I said, well, this is cool. And he said, well, <laughs> all right. And so I actually set up um, one of the first Night Scout builds in Orange County, California, working with JDRF at the time because a good friend of mine was working there. And I said, can we set up a build session so people can see what this is? And she was all about it. One of our members worked for Microsoft and his son was a type one, and he was already aware of, of Night Scout. So he hosted it. And the morning we were set up to go, JDRF International called her and said, you can't do this. This is not FDA approved. She said, okay, we won't do it in the future, but we're set to go. That day, we put 14 people up on Night Scout. And really surprising to me, literally all the people involved with the development of Night Scout flew in for this event. So I got to meet, I mean, certainly met Ben and Ben West and Eileen Despero and James Wedding and, and uh, Wes Nordgren. And they all were there. And I didn't have any sense of who they all were, but it was just cool. John Caustic actually personalized my Pebble watch. He goes, do you want it to say your name? I go, oh, wow. Yeah. And he sat down and typed away and gave it to me. And so I just started poking around when there was some event because I thought this was important. I thought this was helpful. I could see it. And it also, I don't know if you'd seen the Pebble watch, but they, they had programmed in little messages. So if you were 100, you'd get a, a you know, woohoo message on your watch. If it went over 200, you'd get a message like, uh-oh. And that helped. It really made you smile. It was a very heady time. 2014, as you mentioned, I believe that is the year that the CGM in the Cloud Facebook group started, right? which brought the technology that a few people had been kind of working on and those names that you mentioned. It brought it to many, many more people. The builds started. The community, the Night Scout community found each other and, and formed. And as you listen, if, if none of those names sound familiar and you're not sure what we're talking about, I've done a lot of episodes. You can actually use the hashtag we are not waiting, all one word, and find those episodes with John Costick and, and Lane Despero and, and the beginnings and Ben West. And uh, it, it was really just a heady time. And it's so great to kind of hear you bring us back to that, Joanne. It was so much fun. Yeah. I mean, I had to carry around an extra phone. I had to have a little kit with me yeah. for something I didn't need. I wasn't monitoring a child. I was monitoring myself. But I liked that it was going somewhere. And um, I think w when you built, and, and the, the um, instructions were actually done, the original way to build um, Night Scout was developed by Gail DeVore. And so I'm still working with her on advocacy. But it was so early on, how do you do this? And it took me days and lots of sweat. <laughs> just like <laughs> doing it and then I get error messages. And then when you finally did build, you got a certificate in the mail. So I still have that. And I think I was something like number 300 to build. Mm -hmm. And now it's thousands and thousands and they're worldwide. And it's it was just exciting. And I knew it was going to be more. And that brings me to the group Loop and Learn, which I started actually 
before COVID in 2019. It was just a local support group that we called SoCal Loopers because we were all in Southern California. And it covered anyone from San Diego up through Northern LA. But we met in Orange County, which is the middle. And we actually met four times before COVID. The first time we were in a real estate office on a Sunday in their conference room. And actually, Ben West drove up from San Diego to, to <laughs> come in and kind of be our... He just showed up. And... A lot of people were asking questions and we were, everyone brought their Mac and we were all trying to work together and figure out what we needed. And there were a couple of people just starting. There were a couple who had been on for a while. Next meeting, I think, was at UC Irvine, local university, because one of the directors there is a type one and I got him up on looping. I did one at a local hospital where we had about 20, 30 people. And then the director of the hospital found out we were doing something that it wasn't FDA approved. Bowed had a hissy fit <laughs> and uh, said, never again. You are never, ever, ever to do this again. I oh. said, what's the problem? And he said, it's not FDA approved. I said, what is the problem with giving us space to talk? Yeah. And I, he stopped responding. So really disappointed in that. But in January, I was approached by Ann Peters' office. Uh, Dr. Ann Peters is a significant member of our community and in Los Angeles. And she said, I'd like to host an event for you guys in Santa Monica. And I said, do you know what we do? Because I just didn't want to be yelled at again. Right. And uh, she said, we know exactly what you do. And we think you deserve a place to meet. And we have patients that are involved and we'd like to connect with you. So we did an event at the very beginning of February, just before COVID hit, um, had over a hundred people show up. West Oregon did a, a presentation on kind of the history of this hashtag, we are not waiting. Dr. Peters spoke. We had a, a side room where people were helping other people with technical issues. It was pretty heady. It was very exciting, very supportive. And then everything shut down for COVID. Yeah. So we were still SoCal Loopers. I set it up on Facebook and set up a few people as admins with me. And we started developing videos on how do you do loop? What is it? What does the interface look like? What do they mean? What if you press here? What if that works? How do you manage ISF? How do you manage all the settings that you need to manage with a DIY loop? Right. And we started getting members. And then we started getting members internationally because we set up a YouTube channel so that people could see the videos over and over again and realize that we were SoCal loopers worldwide. <laughs> and that that rename didn't last very long. And then we rebranded to Loop and Learn and we grew. I bet. So let me ask you, since 2014, you know, a lot of the commercial technology has caught up, let's say, remote monitoring, better hybrid closed loops, you know, at least the stuff talks to the other stuff, whether it's in limited form or not, at least there's some conversation happening now between pumps and CGMs. Do you think people are still going to turn to the DIY and the loop and things like that in the in the years coming up? Absolutely. The FDA cannot, because of their fears of safety, allow the majority of people to set tight boundaries for their control. Right. They have to aim this at the majority of people who have to stay safe. And, and that's perfectly fine. It does a fairly good job. But if you've been doing DIY, you can set your target ranges, you can tighten control, and there are no limits to the things you can tinker with. And I understand the majority of new closed loop systems, actually all of the new closed loop systems are targeted at probably the average T1D and some portion of T1Ds that are in the segment that Lane Despero calls the, the dark matter, the ones who <laughs> don't ever do anything. This at least does it for them. Any closed loop is better than no closed loop. And yeah, it's hard to remember sometimes, but we, and I put the podcast audience in this group, and certainly the CGM and the cloud and the loopers, you know, we are in, in the top, what, probably 5% of informed, you know, people who use technology. Yeah. And I don't mean that in some kind of pejorative way, like those people don't know anything. It's just diabetes takes so much time and effort. I wrote a book and I, and one of my chapters was how much time it takes to be a diabetic. And I think it, it came in somewhere between 10 and 20 hours a week that covers insurance, ordering your supplies, organizing your supplies, 
running your stuff, changing sites, fixing problems, calling doctor's offices. It's a part-time job. It sure is. Let's talk a little bit, if we could, about your other passion, and that is talking about and helping people who are aging with type 1. And of course, knock on wood, God willing, we're all aging, right? right? But this is really interesting because, as you mentioned, you weren't supposed to live this long. Right. Um, about four or five years ago, I'm now 67, but four or five years ago, I started looking at, and the reason I wrote my book was the fear of being in the hospital and being in the hospital and losing control and being in the hospital in the hands of people that don't understand that type one is different than type two. It's a very frightening experience. And then I thought as we age, the likelihood of us having to interface with the medical community increases, not only because we're aging and aging people have things that go wrong, but because of type one complications that start to occur or just fatigue, emotional fatigue, cognitive issues, or just get tired of it. So I have a local support group and of adult type ones, and I tapped into about 12 of them who are also aging. Also, we're told we'd be dead by 40. And we started meeting at my house and saying, what are the issues? What are we concerned about? I got in touch with Bill Polanski, who runs Behavioral Diabetes Institute. Uh, he's a psychologist. And Paul Madden, who's also a psychologist in a type 1, who worked with Jocelyn Clinic for years, Jocelyn Diabetes. And I said, can you help me on this? Because I think this is an important issue. Nobody's talking about it. And Bill Polanski said, well, what's the problem? You get to live longer. And I said, no, no, we're grateful. Honestly, we're very grateful. But it's not without its issues. And he sat back and he went, huh, it's kind of like people with HIV. They weren't supposed to live this long, but they Definitely. are now. And the medications have caused complications. The disease itself causes complications, but they're living with it now. And they're also aging. It's, it's the, really the only similar diabetes entity that has issues with aging that, are, that need to be examined and paid attention to. One of my concerns was always being in the hospital and having people not understand that I have diabetes at all or that it's type 1. And I had taken a friend to the hospital because she had sepsis. I didn't know she had sepsis. And we, I brought her in and all of a sudden they converged on her in the ER. And I was sitting with her and these two young people showed up with backpacks and wearing dark scrubs. And their backpack said, sepsis team. And I said, who are you guys? It was like, you know, men in black. They said, wow. we showed up on the scene and they said, we're the sepsis team. I said, okay, what do you do? And they said, we take over and we take this patient through all the people that have to help while that patient's critically ill with sepsis. So I thought, huh, I want a T1D team. Yeah. Um, when you end up in the hospital, there should be a specialist who oversees all the care of all T1Ds in the hospital. There aren't that many that they couldn't be done. And I understand in England, there are T1D specialists. When a T1D shows up in the hospital, there's a specialist. Why we don't have that here, I do not know. But I started thinking, well, I would like a wristband. When they go to the hospital, they put paper bands on you for allergic to penicillin, fall risk, anything that they think are critical. I said, can I have a T1D band? And I asked the local hospital, could you do that? Could you just yeah. order T1D bands? And they said, well, that's an interesting idea. We can do that in about five years. <laughs> so I went to a printer and I got 500 printed. It cost me $70. And I just give it to friends and say, here, put this in your go bag. If you end up in the hospital, slap this on your hand. They won't take off a paper band. They'll take off jewelry. Right. And has, has anybody done that? Has it helped? I have done it. And a few others have done it. I don't know if it's made a difference, but it's certainly a, f a sense of safety that you can stick out your arm and say, pay attention. This is important. Ask me questions, but don't treat me like a type two. I don't see that it isn't something that is absolutely critical because type ones are different. We are 24 hours away from dead. So it's it's a critical issue. And when you're in the hospital, even if they're treating you for something that's not diabetes, their attention is not on your diabetes. And that part can kill you or leave you in the hospital a lot longer than you need to be. 
Well, the book is The Savvy Diabetic, A Survival Guide. Do you cover more than being in the hospital? Is there other other points you'd like to make from that? Well, yeah, it's, it's how do you effectively interact with your doctors? How do you effectively travel? And how do you just basically are, be prepared? There's a packing list. So if you have to go to the hospital, it's not an emergency. What do you need to pack? I thought it was going to be a pamphlet when I was putting it together because my other thing is being prepared. I don't consider myself a worry person. I just don't like to be surprised. So I all through COVID, I've been kind of hammering on, be prepared, put up like a personal medical resume together. And I have that up on my website that you can download some forms and I'm kind of updating that now. But when you go to the hospital, you should have your medical list. You should have what medications you take and when you take them, because you can't assume they know you. And so I have this whole little set of how do you be prepared? And I worked with Nicole Johnson and we did a video on it, but I really don't think people do it because it's really annoying to pull together all your data. It's just another task you have to do, but I think it's a good task. We talked about go bags, just be ready to grab a bag and go. And I have a list of what you'd put in the go bag. And I think it's important to So if you end up in the hospital or if you end up in urgent care, you don't know what's going to happen. Be prepared. And certainly during COVID, your family couldn't show up with you. So it was just, it's not that hard once you do it, but it's just the getting at it that's kind of a challenge. But I think it's, it will make your life easier in the long run, even though initially it's a little bit extra work. One of the things that I think about a lot as I get older (laughs) is, all of the health issues that just happen without diabetes that I assume haven't been studied in people with type 1, right? No. I mean, th- something like menopause, something right. like bone health. I mean, you talk about things that happen to your body from the age of, say, 45 to 105. Right. I mean, there's, there's arthritis, so your hands don't easily handle the yeah. devices and or if syringes. No, it has not been studied. And I've been doing some projects with UC San Diego's Diabetes Design Initiative. What do you need? So this term, they've been working on a healthcare directive sheet that if you go to the hospital, tells any healthcare provider that you deal with that you have type 1 diabetes. This is how you manage it. This is what you take. This is what you need. These are my comorbidities. These are my conditions that I have in addition to type 1. And they've been working on They're testing these little one sheets that you would take with you. But in my DIY community, we've already developed that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Because if you go, even if if you go for colonoscopy, you're under anesthesia. So I always bring information to show them how to, that I have a CGM and this is what you can watch to monitor. That This is what I take and this is how I'm going to manage my pump. It just makes it easier. So we have Someone just came to me having plastic surgery out of the country and to, do you have any devices that'll help? And I, so I gave her all the, the documentation to make sure someone can understand what she needs when, yeah. when she can't speak for herself. And as we age, the topic that we don't like to talk about is cognition. And when you go to the hospital, you get overwhelmed a little bit. And so you have to remember what to tell them as you age. <laughs> You can forget what to tell them, or you can forget a critical medication. So it's how do you represent yourself? How do you help your advocate who, or your spouse or whoever to help you? Because you may not be fully in charge of yourself. And as we age, as scary that as that is, it's kind of a reality. It is coming. And the type one group that didn't have all the tools is aging into this category so fast. I think it's beginning to get some attention. There's a lot of research going on at the University of Utah on monitoring and remote monitoring and what do you want your advocate to do with you when they get a message. So I think it's beginning. I want it to go faster. But, hmm. you know, hashtag we are not waiting. <laughs> I want it yesterday. But I see the beginning of it. Aging with diabetes isn't real pretty for most people. Some people skate by and they're fine and they really age well and don't have problems. And that's wonderful. In this demographic that were diagnosed around my time, they're more likely to have issues. And no, nobody's studying. It's just beginning. Earl Hirsch is doing a lot of work up at University of Washington as well. 
because he's a type one and he's aging. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, maybe that's what it takes is that the, the people involved to really carry this through. It is a community, at least since I've been part of it, which has only been 15 years, that does take care of itself. It, you know, it, that's the whole we are not waiting movement. It's it's like things aren't moving fast enough. So people step up and I don't know how we do it for this cohort, right? For, you know, you, you can't really do this on your own, but maybe just the attention that you and others are bringing to it, that we have to look at these things. We have to study these things because, you know, people with type one, thankfully, are living longer than ever. You can't ignore that. Oh, absolutely. And and it's an unusual disease. It, yeah. It's an urgent disease and you self-monitor. There are very few diseases that I know are like this, aside from the word control, which I don't like. But self-management is really fairly critical. And as you age, you're going to have to depend on people. You just do. That's what happens over time. And people very often depend on their spouse, but a spouse can die. I've told my husband he can't. <laughs> made the deal no no you have to wait you, you can die the next day <laughs> you need to be there but who do you prepare yeah beyond that and how do you continue to be resilient emotionally how do you do yeah. all that i would love to see a track in nursing school that develops a specialty in type 1 diabetes that makes them available and maybe even start with retired nurses who could step in and be chartered to be healthcare allied professionals to help aging type ones. I think that would, might be the best source because it isn't going to be the endocrinologists. It isn't going to be the nurse practitioners. It isn't going to be your brother or your child because you don't want to bother your children. So it's got to be someone who has an understanding already. I think that might be a way, but I really don't know. We've talked a lot about your past and, you know, kind of pre-COVID what was going on and how you've, how you've kept things going during COVID. What are you looking forward to in the next couple of years? Your husband joked that you're, you're kind of retired, but <laughs> what are you looking forward to? I'm retired doing 20 hours a week on Loop and Learn. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, that's interesting because there are lots of changes going on in the DIY world in the last month or two. And with changes with Dexcom and Abbott, and access to data. That's the big buzz. And the big fear for those of us in DIY, it's it's beyond fear. It's how do we make sure we get access to data? And we're trying to maintain dialogues, at least with one of the CGM manufacturers who will talk about how do we ensure that we get our data? It's our data. And how do we ensure the FDA allows us to have our data? And why do they get to say we don't? So there's a an advocacy issue that's pretty strong and growing right now. I'm involved with that because it feels outrageous to me that I should have to fight for my data. I understand devices are made by somebody else, so I use their device, but it is my data. I understand the desire to keep us safe. Once again, it's our data, and I'm hopeful that we will continue to have that access I think DIY will continue and continue to develop, and it may be hopefully in some point in the future merge into a more mainstream where we don't, I don't want to do this. I would love to just buy something off the shelf, let my insurance pay for it, and have customer support who I could understand who would actually troubleshoot if I needed that. We're all beginning to talk in my group saying, how much control are we willing to give up? How much excellence are we willing to give up to not worry? I see a lot of work being done um, at the university level on multivariate sensors, which excite me because they, they look at lactate and ketones as well as insulin levels. Wouldn't that be cool Yeah, to, to look at a, a dashboard and, and see that information to a diagnose or figure out what's going wrong when things go wrong or how to exercise better. So technology will continue. I, I'm chasing down a lot of the technology companies that are developing CGMs, mostly out of this country, and it's real hard to communicate with them. But I just want to talk to them and say, what are you doing different? Yeah. They're going to be uh, micro needle patches. I've been watching that for a while. That would be cool. <laughs> um, anything that takes away burden, makes it easier, doesn't hurt, and works well. Sounds good to me. Joanna, I thank you so much for joining me, for spending so much time with me. I really appreciate it. 
thank you for all your care for this community. I, I appreciate everything you do and your podcasts are amazing. Thank you, Stacy. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. More information about the Savvy Diabetic and the Loop and Learn Group and everything we talked about, there are always links in the show notes. If you're listening on a podcast app, that's easy to find. But if you are not sure, you can always head over to diabetes-connections.com and click on the episode homepage. Every homepage, if you're new, has the links that I talk about, some other information about me and the show. And starting in January of 2020, I added transcriptions for each episode. So look, we do the best we can. My transcription software doesn't speak diabetes perfectly. I do go through and try to make it as clear as possible, but I do miss some things sometimes. My favorite, I mean, it's so funny, just as a quick aside, how it corrects diabetes stuff. It does not like the term A1C. It corrects it to the most bananas things like, hey, Wendy, or hey, I see. Or, I mean, it's, I I could put examples of that and I should probably just do a blog post and throw some of the wackiest examples of how it corrects things. My poor editor, his name always gets mangled. So if you want to go check out the transcription, that's always at the episode homepage. And I also do have a really robust search. If you, again, if you're new, I've been doing this show for close to seven years now, and there's a search box in the upper right. I would urge you to use that and find the episodes that are of interest to you or use the category. We break it down by, you know, artists, athletes, technology, news episodes, living with type one, which is very general, but you'll see the categories there and it may help you if you are not quite sure where to start with more than 440 episodes now. Before I let you go, two quick pieces of housekeeping. I have a new guide on the website. It is all about getting organized with your diabetes supplies. It's a way to clean it up, clear it out, where to donate, that kind of stuff. It should pop up as soon as you go to the website. If you have any issues and you'd like to receive that, just shoot me an email or let me know in the Facebook group. We are moving our other guides. I've been doing this for about a year or two now over to shop. If you go to the shop on the website, it's kind of a bookstore right now. So you've got the world's worst diabetes mom, and then you can also sign up for our other guides. And those are all free, but they are listed in the shop. I'm going to be adding more as we go on. That's been really fun and the reaction has been great. And then the number two bit of housekeeping is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Club 1921 is live. We are still making changes to how you sign up. Those should be done by the beginning of February. It's just a little bit of cleaning up. And if you're not familiar, Club 1921 is where diabetes connections are made. This is my new service where you'll be able to find diabetes events, any type of diabetes, anywhere in the country. It's U.S. only for right now. I did get a few people asking me about that. Right now, U.S. only. Go ahead, check it out, tool around. It's a very simple website, but the idea is you would sign up once and then never have to come back because if events are added that fit your criteria, which you will enter, we will email you when new events are added that are what you're looking for. If you want to add events, that's a little bit of a different sign up. And I think that's where some of the confusion has come from. So I'm working on that right now and I'll keep you posted. But boy, am I excited about that. And thanks for those who are testing it. I mean, it's basically in beta right now. So if you are one of the dozens, and it's, it's small right now, and that's fine, who have signed up, who are checking it out, I'm only sharing it at the end of the podcast here. I don't want thousands of people there yet, but I really do appreciate the help I'm getting. Your input is invaluable. All right. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. We are back on our regular schedule newscast on Wednesday live on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and then an audio-only podcast on Fridays and these longer interview episodes on Tuesdays. Again, next week is with Tandem. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here soon. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.